Hey, good morning, and welcome to Abundant Life Church. We are so glad that you are here today. People are coming in from the hospitality room. We want to welcome all of those who are online. We are so glad that you are joining us from all over the country. We just want you to know that you're part of our hearts, and we're glad that you're here today. Whatever's happening here in the sanctuary, we want to be happening in your home or if you're driving down the highway. So if we start dancing here, you might have to pull over to dance, but just enjoy the presence of the Lord today, and let's have a great time. Why don't you stand with me this morning and turn our attention to the board, and let's make our confessions. Join me, would you please? I am a believer. I am not a doubter. The Word works in me. And at this moment, I humble myself under the mighty hand of God. I cast all my cares over on him. From this moment forward, I refuse to worry. Instead, I will pray. I will use my faith and believe, and he'll exalt me over the problem and over the devil, for I belong to Jesus, and he cares for me. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. The word works in me. I live by faith. The Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. I am born again. I am healed. I am baptized in the Holy Ghost. I pray in the Spirit. I walk in His abundance. I am strong, for He is my strength. And I am highly favored of the Lord and man. I'm a believer, and I am not a doubter. The Word works in me. I choose to rejoice double today. I demonstrate a gentle spirit to all men. Thank you, God, for being near. I'm not anxious about anything, but I am thankful, and I let my request be known to God. I live in the peace of God, and it guards my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. I choose to dwell on those things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Amen. Amen. How many of you agree with that? Amen. Father, we just come in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just, we give our heart to you this morning. We want to know you, Father. We want to just habitate with you. And your word says, Lord, that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Lord, we're not here with a worship team who's going to entertain us. We're not here, Father, to see who can sing the best. But we are here, Father, to please you, to honor you, to bless you. So, Father, I'm asking that you will allow our worship and our praise to be a sweet aroma into your throne room this morning. Father, that you'll receive from us our heart. And, Lord, any area in our life that we are struggling with, we submit it to the cross of Jesus Christ. This morning, Father, I pray that you will cause us to be exhorted, to be comforted, and to be edified. Father, we thank you for it. And Lord, let each one of us walk in the most excellent way your love. We do not want to be a sounding symbol or a gong, Father, but we want to be a sound of pureness because you have filled us with your love. And we receive that love this morning, Father. We adore you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we worship you. Thank you for being our teacher our comforter, our helper. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you remind us of all things that Jesus taught us. We worship you today. Lord, I pray for every heart in this place and those who are listening online. Father, that no matter what they're going through right now, that they can lay everything aside and they can focus on Jesus. They can focus on worshiping the Father. And you will encourage them today, Father. We honor you today. Holy Spirit, 
take us into the presence of our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship Jesus, Thomas.
eyes, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness of death, in the shadows of sleep. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I can't see you with my eyes and faith, 
Bible study, the pastor was talking about what is the greatest thing that we have and what is Jesus giving to us the greatest thing, and it is love. And we all have love for everybody in this in this room. And you know, he sacrificed everything for us, and he's giving us that love back. So today, when we sing this song, sing with love. Sing it out. It doesn't have to be the most perfect thing in the world, but sing out the words. Because this song speaks to me in every way, and I hope it speaks to you. So whenever we sing this song, I would like everybody to sing out. Love is
whatever your chain is today, whatever it is, it's broken in the power in the name of Jesus. But if you allow it to hang on to you, then Satan's won. But if you understand the power that comes through Jesus Christ, that chain has already been demolished. And if you'll receive that freedom today, the prison doors are open, the chains have fallen off. It doesn't matter what it is, sickness, disease, emotions, it doesn't matter. Jesus is your answer. Jesus is your freedom. And if you'll just receive it, and when the enemy comes in and attacks you, you can just stand and say, I'm already free. The chains have already been broken. You cannot put me back into torment again because I am free in the name of Jesus. Too many times we agree with what Satan's telling us instead of agreeing with what the Word says. And we've got to learn to agree with the Word. Every chain is broken. Every sickness, every disease, don't get into agreement. Don't let your emotions get into agreement with the negative that Satan is bringing against you because God has already defeated him. The Holy Spirit comes to convict us, to convict us, bring to light the righteousness that God has given us. And the righteousness says that we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We've been set free, we've been delivered. We have to receive it. It's a free gift given to you. But if you don't open up that package, it'll hold on to you. But today, I want you to rejoice in the fact that you're free. I want you to rejoice in the fact that you are free. In Jesus' name. Let's sing this again, and let's rejoice that we're free today.
when Jesus died on the cross, the last thing that he said is, it is finished. And a lot of times we think that what he was talking about is giving up his life. But in actuality, the thing that was finished is every chain was broken, every disease was defeated, every sin, every habit that's ungodly has been broken off of you if you choose to walk in it. It's your choice. God has set you free. And I'm excited about that freedom. How about you? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, I'm not quite sure why you're seated. I need you to stand back up. And I need you, here, here's, here's how we're going to just kind of finish up worship time. And I, I don't want you to just go to somebody and ask them how their day is. I want you to go to somebody and I want you to bless them. I want you to speak blessings into their life. Don't ask them about the weather. Don't care. Go to somebody and bless them in Jesus' name. Go ahead and move your seat. Got to get out of your seat. Don't wait for people to come to you. Go to somebody. Don't sit there. Get up. Do something. Bless somebody this morning. If you're watching online, I'm telling you, you are blessed in Jesus' name. We love you, and we're glad you've joined us today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning. We want to welcome all of those again who are watching online, and we want to especially welcome Pastor Eric Roberts from Liberia, West Africa. Him and his church have joined us online this morning. Pastor Eric, we are so glad that you're with us today. Hi, sweetheart. We're so glad that you guys have joined us today from West Africa. Amen. Well, let me ask you, how many of you love Jesus? Uh, you know, I just, I just get that feeling that you really do. I just, yeah, wow. God is good all the time. Look, she's sneaking. She needs a hug, Greg. <laughs> she's going to bless you. Where's Thomas? Thomas, Thomas. Come here, brother. I know you've got to run to work before he goes. Listen, you know what? Um, we, need to, we need to honor and respect and give God thanks for the things that he's done in people's lives. And uh, Thomas has done an incredible job here on the worship team but he also, uh, when I came here three and a half years ago, he was the third manager in charge at Chili's. And then he moved up to second manager in charge. And about a month ago, he came to me and said, pray, the general manager is leaving, the position's open. And on Monday, I got pictures of him just kind of spazzing out at a meeting. He is the new general manager of Chili's. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And so um, we just want to honor him and faithfulness in prayer in God and in your business brought you to this place. And that's the effect of those kind of great prayers. If I got hold of people and said, this is what we need to pray, these four key points, they were all aligned because they came in and gathered to be learned. So four agree in prayer is done. Amen. Amen. So, <laughs> so, so because he's the new general manager and it's a, it's a holiday, he has to go to work. <laughs> Amen. Hey, we want to honor all of the veterans this morning. If you served in our military in any capacity, I'd like for you to stand up. Thank you, Harley. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. Brother Al, back in the back, he was already standing. <laughs> now, if, you, if, you, if you've been here for a while and you see Harley coming in and out um, and you hear his, his cane clicking, um, Harley went into the military 
in one piece and during the Grenada War in 1986, uh, he got hit with shrapnel and um, he should be dead. And God has just blessed him and, and we're just... We're just thankful for your service, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else that served in the military besides Al and Harley? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, today uh, we're having a special day. Right after service, we have a uh, spaghetti lunch. You want to come talk about it? No, go ahead. Come on, talk. Here. You don't talk very much, so... Come tell us what all you're doing this afternoon. Well, good morning. Uh, all right, we have a spaghetti dinner slash dessert cakewalk. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. So our spaghetti dinner today is $7 for adults, $3 for kids. And all the money goes to help our children's ministry. Um, and the reason you're not getting dessert on your plate is because we're going to do the cakewalk. So a dollar per ticket for the cakewalk or... If you find a cake or a dessert over there that you just really love and you think you got to have it and you don't want to chance the cakewalk, you can buy that cake for $20. However, we do have a, two Marcia cakes here today. Woohoo! If you don't know, <laughs> if you don't know, you're going to want to walk until you get one of those because those are awesome cakes. She decorates beautifully. <laughs> so we do have two. So make sure that you just grab yourself a ticket and. Um, yeah, every, the tickets are $1 for the cakewalk. Every time you walk, it's a dollar, right? Yep. So. And, and, I, and I know my daughter, did she, yes. did she make that? She, she mm. made a chocolate chocolate chip bunt today, which is also awesome. I did try. Not, not velvet, not red not velvet? Not red velvet today, but chocolate chocolate, chocolate chip. Chocolate chocolate. Isabel's good. Melissa. But she didn't make <laughs> that cake, but it, Melissa did. But anyway, we there's did there's some good cakes, pies I saw. Yeah, a couple of pies, cakes, cookies. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> we got it. Children's so ministry. So stay for lunch. This is this is to uh, help our children's ministry. They have a lot that they're doing. They're getting ready for our Christmas uh, play that they're going to be doing. We have a lot that's happening, and they're raising money. So hang around this afternoon. As soon as church is over, uh, we'll serve here in the hospitality room. And then the cakewalk will be here in the overflow room. So seven dollars for adults, three dollars for children. If you if you didn't come prepared, just please talk to us. If you have a dollar, we don't care. Just help us out. You know, yeah. we could write a check. Uh, we don't care. Bless, just bless the children's ministry. Make it a good check. Yes. No. <laughs> amen. Amen. Wow, God is good, guys. I'm just. Uh, how many of you been involved in the prayer boot camp? How many of you is it just stirring you up? You know, we did a twelve week we did a twelve week spiritual boot camp through this summer, and now we've done we're, we've started this prayer boot camp. And let me let me ask you this: How many of you are just finding yourself throughout the day just praying in the spirit? You know, when you're focused on it and you're doing it thirty minutes every morning, then throughout the day you just find you allowing the Holy Spirit just to pray through you, and and uh, wow, it's it's been incredible. Because we're doing this, the Lord has, I, I mean, there has been some things that I've been asking the Lord for for some time about, Lord, what about this and what about this? And, and this week, the Lord's just started lining some things up and giving me answers and going, look, here, here's how you do this, here's how you do this. When we press into the presence of God, God presses back into us, opens our heart. And it's probably God, it, it's not that God was, didn't have our he wasn't open to us before. It was probably that our ears were closed. Have you ever, have you ever had to, uh, uh, have you ever had your ear just stop up and you go in and you get a, a Q-tip and you start cleaning out your ear and, and all of a sudden you realize you need another Q-tip and you get another one? And, and I, I think some of us need to get some spiritual Q-tips and do some spiritual cleaning. And that's done through prayer and through the word. Amen. Amen. So if, if you have not got involved in the uh, prayer boot camp, please let me know. 
it's on Facebook or I'm texting it to some people and I'm emailing it to some people, but it is a private group. And if you don't do it, you're kicked out. Boot camp is serious. Okay? We're serious. Just like boot camp, <laughs> you're gone. <laughs> hey man, how many of you are ready to give this morning? Four of you? Let's try that again. How many of you are ready to give? It's time to give. If you're watching online, you can go right there to Shop Now on Facebook, or you can go on our webpage, alife.church, and hit Give. Or there is, on the screen, there is a text number that you can text, and you can give right there online. And for all of those in the sanctuary, you can give online too. I know that's how I do all my giving is online. Uh, But just give and allow the Lord to bless and honor you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you have given us the opportunity to give. And Lord, according to Corinthians, we make the decision. Lord, to be a cheerful giver and to give, Father, as you put it in our heart to sow abundantly into your kingdom. Father, I thank you for it. Lord, I thank you that you're blessing your people. I thank you for promotions, for increases, for investments to increase. I thank you, Lord, that you are blessing your body. But you don't do that, Father, just so we can hoard it up and go buy bigger houses and nicer cars. You do that, Father, so we can further the kingdom of God. So, Father, help us to be responsible in our giving, in our finances, in our stewardship. And, Father, we give you praise for it. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts that's coming in this morning. And, Lord, thank you that you are meeting every need here. I thank you, God, that you are providing the money to redo the gym, put a new roof on it, remodel the gym. Uh, Lord, I thank you you're providing the money for the new heater system we need. Lord, we just thank you that you meet every one of our needs, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, go ahead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hi, Carol. Good to see you walk in. Carol has to work lots of Sundays, so we don't get to see her much. And then Andrea came in today. You guys look good. Smiling big. How they glow, some of them do. I agree with you, man. I agree with you. Thank you, Lord. Hey, we've got a special surprise for you this morning. We've got some special guests with us. We have Doug and Jeannie Mc... Let me say it right. McClung with us this morning, right? They have been in Germany the last 30 years as missionaries, and this church has been supporting them for some time, and they're here on vacation, and when they go back, they're not going back to Germany. Uh, They are moving to Belgium, and they're going to begin a new mission work in Belgium, and they're here today to take a little bit of time and just share with us about their work, about their ministry, and uh, we just want them to come. And who's coming first, both of you or one of you? Or Come on, brother. He's going to teach a little bit and share a little bit, and then when they're done, I'm going to teach for a little bit. They laugh. Did you see them laugh? Did you? <laughs> well, we'll be out of time, so I can't share too much. There you go, brother. Okay, good morning. I've enjoyed worshiping with you today, and I also want to greet those people that are online. So uh, God bless you all. Uh, It's great to be here. Thank you, Pastor Dusty, for giving us the opportunity to share. I think I just want to pray now before we get into our section presentation. We're going to do this in two parts. I want to share a little bit uh, with you out of the Word of God to encourage you and some missions principles. 
And then we're going to pull up some slides about our work in Germany and our future work in Belgium. My wife works in the red light district of uh, big cities in, in Europe, and she's going to be sharing about her ministry rescuing women from the streets of Berlin. So uh, let's uh, go to the Lord one more time in prayer. And then if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Nehemiah. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah for a few minutes, uh, pulling out some truths about missions and about favor, God's favor upon your life and your calling. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. We thank you, Jesus, that you truly do break every chain. Your work on the cross enabled us to live victorious and to have an abundant life. I'm thankful for this congregation here in Enid, Oklahoma, God, worshiping you in spirit and truth, growing in the word of God, having outreaches. And so, Lord, I bless this congregation in your wonderful name. Your will be done this morning, and we give you the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' wonderful holy name. Amen. If you have a Bible, uh, turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. I want to give a, a little bit of background on this uh, these two chapters, chapter 1 and 2, Nehemiah is living in what is today, modern-day Iraq. This happened all about 500 years before Jesus came on the scene. What had happened, Nebuchadnezzar had come to Jerusalem and Judea and had destroyed the city of Jerusalem, torn its walls down, burned the gates, ravaged the temple, took back all of the instruments of the temple back to Babylon, and with him, most of the people, most of the Jews went back into captivity. This is called the 70-year captivity or exile of, the, of Israel. So now Nehemiah is there and he's wondering, how about the people that stayed in Jerusalem? There was a remnant of people there. How is it going with them? Are they doing okay? Uh, what's the state of affairs? Some of his friends had come back now from Jerusalem, back to visit him in the city of uh, Shusha here, and uh, so he asked him, uh, he asked his friends concerning those who had survived the captivity, and they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and I mourned for many days and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You see this man's heart? It wasn't just he saw a need. Oh, two bad things over there are going terrible. But he went before the Lord with a sincere heart. He fasted, he prayed, he waited on God. And he began to intercede for the people there who were in distress, who were beaten down. They were occupied by foreign uh, governors at that time. And he prayed, he said in verse 6, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants. And I confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. How do we get into these messes? It's all a result. When we sin, we find ourselves in difficult situations. Our spiritual house usually breaks down before our natural house breaks down. And that's what happened in Israel. They turned away from the Lord uh, and his commandments. And then as a result of that, a foreign army came in. Jeremiah the prophet said, uh, called them to repentance, turn back to the word of God, turn back to the truth. And they rejected that. They didn't believe him. He said, you will go into captivity for 70 years. So now that 70-year period was just about over, and God was now going to bring them back, be merciful to them. We have acted very corruptly, verse 7, against you, and we have not kept the commandments, verse 7, and the statutes and the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. That happened back then. It happened in A.D. 70 when they destroyed the temple and where the Jews were scattered among the nations. Now they're coming back. Eight million Jews today in Israel. There are still seven million Jews still scattered throughout the world. I understand about two million in New York. But God has brought them back since they were a nation in 1948. That's just a sideline from where we're going this morning. But that's the pattern when people forsake God 
uh, they get into big messes. But God is always merciful and will draw them back. And here it is. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen for my dwelling. So there was the promise. And here is Nehemiah with a heart to do God's will. God, be merciful to us. Forgive us. We have sinned. We have acted corruptly. And now he wants to do the will of God. And so he's praying and seeking God. Chapter 2. We're just going to do chapter 1 and chapter 2. So we got through chapter 1 pretty quick. Chapter 2 is where uh, Nehemiah goes before the king. He is his cupbearer. He brings the wine to the king every day. And one day he comes before the king. He is sad. His countenance has fallen. Why are you sad, the king asks. Asks, this is not a sickness. This is sorrow of the heart. And uh, Nehemiah said to the king in chapter 2, 3, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, What do you request? What, what are you asking for here? Nehemiah, and then it said, so I prayed to the God of heaven. All through the book of Nehemiah, there's 13 prayers that he prayed. He was a man of prayer. He sought God before I go and asked my request of the king. I'm going to seek God's favor first. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, and this is a key part of this, as missionaries and as you... We need favor in our lives. Nehemiah was needing favor from the king. You know, each and every one of you that have received Jesus Christ as your personal favor, you have found favor from the king. God has given you grace to believe in Jesus Christ. You have received favor in that sense, his grace, unmerited favor. And through faith, you become a child of God. You're a part of the kingdom of God. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We're missionaries to a foreign country, but you're missionaries here in Enid, Oklahoma. You're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And uh, so we have received grace in that sense. And then we have specific assignments, pastoring the church, being a children's director, whatever, teaching a school, businessman, uh, you know, working at Chili's. Every time we go down this major uh, road, we see Chili's, and we've eaten there many times. So now I'll, I'll remember, hey, Thomas is there, Brother Thomas. But he needs favor, and he got favor, right? He got promoted. There are times uh, in this world we need special favor. Nehemiah was praying, God, I, when I come before the king, what you put in my heart for, for me to be able to do that, I'm going to need your blessing. I'm going to need your favor. So he goes before the king, and uh, he said, if I have found favor in your sight... I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me. Wow, he asked for time off from work. He said, I want to go rebuild this city. But he had a job before the king. It, said, it pleased the king to send him. You know, the Bible says the heart of the kings are in the hands of the Lord. He turns them whichever way he will. And, and uh, the king Artaxerxes here, God turned his heart to favor Nehemiah and his request. Wow, so he got permission. A lot of times we need that, don't we? To do an assignment, we need permission. We've received permission by our missions department to go to Belgium on an assignment. We got the permission. We'll need permission to get into Belgium. We'll need visas, passports. We'll need uh, favor when we look for housing, when we look for a place to worship. We're going to need favor, just like he uh, obtained this from the king. So he had permission and was permitted to go. Furthermore, he needed provision for his work. And he said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through it till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asap, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber, 
to make the beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, and for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Okay, you're allowed to go. What do you need? You need timber to build those gates. There's many gates. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, there's like 12 gates going in. And they had burned them to the ground. And so he needed timber. And the king said, okay, here's a letter to the guy who runs the forest. And when you need it, give that to him, and he'll give you all the timber you need to build. Wow, that's great. And then there are times we need protection. When we go into a foreign country or a foreign situation, we need protection. And uh, it was no different then. Nehemiah knew that he was going into an area that they didn't like the Jews. They would just assume that Jerusalem would never be built. He had some enemies there in verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Who are these? Who is this guy coming? What does he want to do here? Rebuild the city? Are they wanting to come back into power? And if we are doing the Lord's work, we can ex expect opposition. We can expect that not everybody is going to be happy about it. In fact, there's people that will resist the work. You know, sometimes it even comes from religious organizations. They don't see it the way you do, and they resist it. Other times it's from secular groups. We're going to Belgium, and uh, right now the second largest religion in Belgium is Islam. They, ha they train jihadists in Brussels. And uh, there is uh, definitely uh, a threat there. You know, I, I love all people. And I want to preach the gospel to everybody. And yet, there are times you need, you will need protection. When my wife goes out on the streets in Berlin, and she's rescuing, taking uh, women off the street, the pimps don't like that. They're getting income from that. And so there's a danger, there's a threat. Well, Nehemiah was given even some more uh, favor. It says... Um, in verse 9, then I went to the governors of the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. He sent a military escort to go with Nehemiah to make sure he got there, that nobody would harm him. So he had permission, he had provision, he had protection. And now he was in Jerusalem looking around. He said he went by night, he looked at the the walls, he checked it all out. He hadn't shared his vision, his heart yet, with uh, the people. And uh, now it was time to share the vision, what God had put into his heart. It wasn't just that he had an idea, hey, this would be a good thing. God gave him that calling. God gave him that purpose and that mission. Nehemiah was a man with a mission. Now in verse uh, 16, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Verse 16, verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Now he shares the vision that they need to build Jerusalem back up. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. They heard his vision, and God uh, laid into their heart, I'm going to join this work. Let's do it. Let's just do it. Let's build it. I think we can. When he shared that vision, God imparted something into the people that said, I'm with you. Pastors, you know you need people to join the vision, people who are willing to participate in your vision. And as missionaries, that's why we come to local churches. We need people to pray for us. Some might uh, feel led to give financially that we will have provision to uh, you know, buy a car and put gas in the car and do whatever we're going to do over there. 
We need people to participate with us in the vision that God has called us. And so we come here and share our vision. Okay, kind of wrap it up now. I think I'm still under 15 minutes. I think i got about two minutes, and I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie. Um, now, when Sanballat, the Hornonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they laughed at us. Have you ever shared something from your heart, and people just kind of, oh, that's a joke. You'll never be able to do that. What are you trying to do here? They, they despise it. They despise it. Uh, and said, verse 19, what is this thing that you are doing? Uh, will you rebel against the king? No, they had the king's permission. Later they said, what you're building here, here, even if a little fox jumped up on that wall, it would knock it down. Here's ne uh, Nehemiah's answer. So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. The God of heaven, God is behind this work. He's going to give us the grace, the power, and everything we need. He's going to see it come to pass. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. So you guys, you have nothing to do with this. We're going to go forward. We give God the glory. Fifty-two days later, they had rebuilt the walls. They had reconstructed those gates. They were in the process of building up the ruins. Fifty-two days, and it was rebuilt. And it said that... Uh, Uh, then they perceived that this work was done by our God. In verse, uh, let me just read that a little more carefully, 6, 16. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened, disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Nehemiah uh, gave God the glory, and we give God the glory. Whatever has happened in Germany, whatever happens in Belgium, we give God the glory, and we know that the God of heaven will cause us to prosper, for we're, our mission is his mission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom has to be preached in all, in all the world as a witness to every nation, and then the end will come. Jesus is coming back. We still have that great commission. His commission, rebuild Jerusalem. Our commission, preach the gospel, establish churches, rescue people from, uh, from those that are in the chains, of prostitution or whatever they're in. But God himself, the God of heaven, will cause us to prosper. And he will cause you to prosper. And he will give you favor in your mission. And your mission, and your mission. I don't know what your mission is. I think everybody here has some kind of mission. And realize, God, give me favor. Give me power. You've given me the Holy Spirit. Now I walk into it. I set my hand to this good work. And we go forward. Okay, Jeannie, come and uh, share a few slides. Okay. They say a picture paints a thousand words, right? So that's why we brought some pictures today, and I hope they come up. So there we go. That's Jack, our son. He is in Woodward. He likes to stay with his youth group when we go and share at churches, and he's going to do his senior year here in the United States when we go back. And um, he is 17. So okay, next slide. That's the city center of Belgium. I guess the best way is to tell you a little bit what we have done, so you know kind of our heart and how we function to know what we believe the future will be, okay? This is the church in Berlin that um, we started with nothing. We started in a little room, first in prayer in our house, and then uh, out at the lake or wherever we could pray with a couple other people. Then a church began to form through prayer. Then we met in our home. Then we met in a little little room that was very little then we grew and moved on but this is the building in Berlin that the IPHC through the go offering helped us to purchase we're grateful next slide this is your brothers and sisters in Berlin this is at the dedication of the sanctuary we're grateful he's provided that and next slide these are Germans who have now taken leadership they're ordained ministers at the top you see our first German 
ordained pastor is Pastor Peter Christine. That's in the ordination service. You see Ben, who was one of our own young people that went through discipleship and youth program, went then to Bible college for four years, and now he's uh, serving the Lord full time. Next slide. A million, over a million refugees came to Germany. And it gave great opportunity to share the gospel. And so we want to continue doing that. There are some refugees there. You can do that through Coffee House Ministry. Next slide. This is the Gallery Coffee House. And the reason why it's called Gallery, there's these pictures all over. Our supervisor painted them all. Artists come and they paint pictures and share the gospel through pictures. And they're in the cafe. It gives us opportunity over a cup of coffee to share the gospel with people that come in. They might not come to your service, but they might come in for a cup of coffee. So there's the cafe, next slide, indoor and outdoor, next slide, one-on-one -on -one you can share and talk, next slide. We love to sing and tell the story of Jesus, this is some of the youth out in the city center of Berlin, East Berlin, that formerly we couldn't go, but the wall is down and we can go, we thank him for that, next slide. Uh, these are our newest ministers, Christian and Tabea Peters, were just ordained. You see Dr. Beecham there with them at their ordination service. And um, next slide. They do a lot uh, in the city. They take the yellow bus and they go to the high-rise communities and share the gospel with the kids. Next slide. They bring that bus and they bring the kids to the building and have youth group meetings. Next slide. You see some of that there. We are so grateful for Christian and Tabea. They work out of Bill Wilson Ministries with us in Berlin, ordained through the IPHC, and they're training other people to work with children and to uh, share Jesus Christ in our city. I'm a bus kid. I was the first one in my family to be born again because somebody told me about Jesus in ninth grade, and I rode the bus to church until my mom became born again. So that's what we pray, that this bus and this ministry will have a good fruit and that many will come to know Jesus through the outreaches. Next slide. Another way is basketball camp. During uh, the fall break and the spring break, um, Germans are coming out a little bit. They used to only like soccer, and they still love their soccer, but... They like the Oklahoma City Thunder a lot, too. So uh, in the fall and in the spring, we can hold basketball camps. And uh, they come for training during the day. And at lunchtime, women make food. They get a good, hearty meal. And then the chaplain of the camp shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's the goal. I'd love to tell you that every one of these young people accepted Christ. That's not true. That's not the case. But if one has or two, praise God. And it's a start. Next slide. But you do whatever you can. Alabaster Jar. This is a ministry that I've been working with for nearly six years now. And uh, it's another coffee, coffee house. We call it the cafe instead of coffee house. Sharing God's light in dark places, next slide, through obedience and compassion, and I can share a little bit more about that in just a minute, next slide, reaching out to the woman at the well, next slide, a place of rest from the darkness, next slide, and I'll stop there and tell you a little bit about Alabaster Jar. Alabaster Jar is a cafe in the year 2000, uh, German government made reform Prostitution has always been tolerated in Germany. But in 2000, they made prostitution a legal profession, acceptable profession. And because of the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and then this happening in 2000, Berlin became a hub for human trafficking. There are over 400,000 prostitutes in Germany. And Alabaster Jar Cafe, is right on Kurfürstenstrasse, which is in the heart of the red light district. You walk outside our doors, and there was a picture of it. Usually there's, I don't put a lot of pictures of the girls because I don't want to exploit them, and I want them to be safe. So that's why I don't have a lot of the pictures of the girls. But outside our door, you'll meet the Bulgarian girls. To the right, you'll meet the group of Hungarian girls. Oftentimes, they're under, under 14. You have to be 18 to be a legal prostitute, but they traffic these young girls in. These girls here, mostly from Hungary, are trafficked, and we know they're 14, 15, 
whatever, and we, we work with the authorities. We call the police when we know they're younger. Down here, you'll have the Polish girls or the Austrians or whatever, Czechoslovakia. And the whole thing is there's street, car after car after car, girl, girl, girl. And they're out there. One of the girls, Addie, and I'll start her story real quick because I don't want to go over my time, but Addie was brought from Slovenia. And she was, she's trafficked. She was a poor girl. She was an orphan girl living in an orphanage all her young life. At 14, she met a man. He Romeoed her like he loved her. And he said, oh, let me take you to Berlin. Let's get married. So he brings her to Berlin with many other girls and puts her immediately out on the streets. And Addie stayed in that situation for six years. And Alabaster Jar Cafe is right there at the center hub area of the street. And the girls can come in and have a nice meal every afternoon, get away from the men. There's no men allowed in our cafe. They can put their feet up, um, get a good meal, get rest. And we try to build a friendship with them so that we can share Jesus Christ. Because they need him. And God loves them. He has a perfect, wonderful plan for their lives. He values them. What these evil people mean for their financial gain, God values their soul. And he gave his life for them just as he did for me. And so the Alabaster Jar Cafe is designed to build relationship so that we can share Jesus Christ to these girls. And uh, they come in every day. Sometimes there's 20, sometimes there's 30, and they'll come in and eat and uh, enjoy the quiet time. They can read. They can go up and sleep in the back. They can have a game and talk. Those are the things we do. And uh, Addie, like I said, was romanced by this man and brought there. And she was there for, like I said, six years, and she'd come in the cafe every day for food. And we'd say, Addie, can we help you leave the streets? I mean, we want to see them leave. We want to help them have the future that God wants for them. And uh, she would never leave. And one day she came in. She'd been beaten and pushed and just roughed up. And she came in sad and crying. And we said, Addie, you can't stay this way. And this is typical of most of the girls. I said, you can't stay that way. God loves you. He's got a great plan for your life. But she wouldn't leave. She wouldn't accept the help. And about three months later, she came in, and she'd been pushed downstairs, and her legs were bleeding from hitting the stairs, and she was suffering with dislocation and broken shoulder. We said, Addie, let us help you. God loves you so much. He wants to give you a good life. Let us help you. You're beautiful. They don't know what their worth is because they're exploited and abused. And so... That day, Addie said yes, so we were able to take her to the hospital. She stayed in the hospital for three weeks. During that time, our team is visiting her every day, and at the end of that time, she agreed to go to the safe house. So we were thankful she wanted off the streets. And so it's not getting off the streets is going to give them freedom. What they need is Jesus Christ is the only way to be free. So uh, that day, she, she said yes, I'll... I'll, I'll leave. So on her physical birthday was the day she was picked up. We took her to the safe house, and she saw the, the room was just a single room with a dresser, um, bed, desk, and a little refrigerator. And she's like, is all this for me? Because, you know, these girls are used to being in a, sleeping in an Internet cafe or sleeping in a room with 10 other girls because they're trafficked. And we said, Addie, Jesus loves you. Yes, this is for you. God has so much for you. Will you receive him today? You know, she's already heard Jesus loves her. He died for her. And that day, Addie accepted Jesus Christ, the day she was picked up from the hospital to go to the safe house, and she saw her room. So that day, she had no other clothes with her. She put on some new birthday outfits that we gave her. But not only that, she put on that robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ gives to all of us when we accept him. And now Addie walks with Jesus Christ. And that's what Alabaster Jar exists for. And that's part of my work. We, you can't have that without having the churches. You've got to have churches where you can disciple people. So important. And so we will go back. 
Our new assignment is to Belgium. We've been 30 years in Germany. Now there's eight licensed and ordained ministers there. And so it's, you work yourself out of a job and you start over. But I humbly ask for your prayers and continued prayers because we can't do it. Oh, my time's up. Can't do it without the Lord and people praying for us. And um, we can't do it alone, but we go back alone. Um, our kids aren't even with us this time. We have four kids. We went with two little girls, had two kids over there, and it's just Mark and I this time. But last time we prayed, Lord, bless the work of our hands, and he did. And I believe he will do it again. And pray that because we're older, I don't know if we'll have 30 more years, but pray that we can quickly see things accomplished and fruit that will stand for eternity. That's our heart. Thank you for sending us, praying for us, and loving us for so many years. You're our partners, and this is your work, and it's the kingdom work, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie, for sharing that, and... Uh Talk to your pastors. He said it would be okay to uh, pass out our prayer cards if there's an usher here uh, or a couple of men. We want to pass that out. That's like a reminder. You could maybe stick that in your Bible and as the Lord leads, pray and uh, for us. It, there's also, uh, you know, the faith commitment part of it where uh, if you feel led to make a monthly faith commitment, you can uh, turn that into your pastor. He sends that to our missions department, goes into our account, and that's how we after we raise our budget, we receive a monthly income to keep us over there. So uh, uh, we don't pressure anybody. If the Lord leads you to make a faith commitment, that's good. Do we have another slide beyond that? Was, was that the end? And uh, uh, maybe some of you are wondering where exactly is, is Belgium. You see it uh, just west of Germany there and east of France, south of England, right there. There it is, <clears throat> a little better. And we're going to be right near the German border. I think maybe we have one more slide locating that. That green area on the far right, there are three regions in Belgium, the French-speaking, the Dutch-speaking, and the German-speaking. And that's that green area. Uh, the Lord willing, that's where we're going to be located, right near Aachen, Germany also. Jeannie will probably be going to the big city of Aachen and looking to establish another alabaster jar ministry there. Next slide. Uh, of course, we're going to do evangelism, church planting, outreach. Next slide. And uh, our mission is the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, and baptize believers. Next slide. Uh, we also want to train up future church planters, mentor them, Thank God in Germany now there are eight licensed uh, IPHC uh, ministers, so we've uh, been able to do that in the past and hope to do that in the future. Next slide. And thank you. Your church has stayed with us for many years. The Robinsons have uh, been faithful in, in giving and many others of you also, and above all for your prayers. So uh, with that, we'll close. And uh, looking forward to the spaghetti dinner. And looking forward to winning one of them cakes. <laughs> Not that I need it. Not that I need it. <laughs> All right. Now read that card, pray over it, hang that on your refrigerator somewhere, and begin to pray for them. When are you looking to go back to Belgium? Heading back in March. Okay. Amen. I got 10 minutes. Shh, don't tell nobody. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray for the McClug family. Lord, we just ask you that you will go with them. Open every door. Give them favor, God. 
Father, we pray that they'll find favor in the eyes of you and in the eyes of man. Father, that you will speak to them strategic ideas of how to take that part of Belgium for the kingdom of God. Father, I thank you that many will come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ through their ministry. Thank you, Father. We honor you today. We give you praise. Father, help us to hear clearly what the Spirit of God is speaking to us. We want to hear your voice. We want to know you. And we want to be obedient to you. So, Father, we just ask you to minister to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been teaching for the last four weeks on the reunions of Scripture. And I promise you, I won't take long. In, in the whole idea of reunion, you know, we think about families coming together to eat dinner, but in actuality, the word reunion means joining together for one purpose, one heart, one mind, becoming one. And if you've been here the last few weeks, I've given you scripture after scripture after scripture that deals with just that, becoming one. This morning, I want to take a few minutes and I want to give you an assignment. Things that I want you to begin to do that's going to cause us to function as one. You might want to grab some pen and paper and start writing some things down. I've shared this with you. It's been some time ago, but the Lord just, just has put this in my heart to share this with you again. For the last few years, the Lord has been dealing with me about the importance of blessing the Lord and blessing each other. The children of Israel came out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, and in Exodus chapter 15, immediately after they came across the Red Sea, God wiped out the Egyptian army. The children of Israel celebrated God. They worshiped. They gave God everything they could give him in honoring him and blessing them. They worshiped God for days. And then you follow them through the history of the next few... Did we have a power shortage? <laughs> we blew a fuse. Are we still online? Yes, okay. <laughs> Over the next few years, if you follow the children of Israel, what you find is that you do not find again where the children of Israel blessed God. They complained. They murmured. They griped. They got mad. They accused Moses of all kinds of crazy stuff. If they had another leader to go to, they probably would have chased after him. They stopped blessing God. I think that the Lord has, I don't think so, I know what the Lord is saying to America today is that God is calling the church to stand back up and begin to bless the Lord again. Look at Psalms 103. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Let me ask you this. How many of you practice that verse? For the lack of hands, I'm assuming that only one person does that. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I'm talking about a lifestyle here. I'm not talking about something that we do on Sunday mornings when we come in here. L listen, I can tell the struggle that people have in worship because they don't practice it at home. 
They want to come to church and they want to be part. They want to worship God, but they don't do it at home. This verse here says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. I want to challenge you today to begin to get involved in a lifestyle of blessing. Blessing the Lord, blessing each other, and blessing those that irritate you. And blessing your political leaders. Whoever they are. Our country is in, we just went through an election. How many of you are glad the election is over? It's not over. They're still fighting over things. They're fighting over things because we have forgot how to bless each other. I believe that the Lord has put a mandate in my heart to begin to declare this message to other people, not just in this church, but this church is going to be the catalyst of us becoming a place of blessing the Lord and blessing each other. Too many times when we get together with each other, we don't speak things that produces life. How's the weather? How many of you know it's going to snow tomorrow? How many of you know that? So we don't need to talk about it, do we? We know it's going to come. We know it's going to happen. So why do we have to greet each other? Have you heard about the snow? We've all heard it. Love each other. Bless each other. Speak life over each other. Speak godliness into each other's lives. I believe America has a window of time. And it is up to the church to begin to open the window for God's blessings to come. It is the church's fault that the country is where it's at today. Listen to me. If you're part of the church, it's our fault that our country is the way it is today. Because we've buried our hands, our heads in the sand. Leave the lights alone, it doesn't matter. <laughs> bury, we bury our heads in the sand. We get distracted by everything around us. Matthew 6, says this. Seek ye first. What does that mean? First thing you seek is what? Anyone else know that verse? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What's the first thing that we're to seek? The kingdom of God. Let me ask you this. Do we have any Republicans in this house? Anybody Republican? Do we have any Democrats in this house? What do we want out of life? whether you're Republican or Democrat, what do we want? Peace, a good life. But you know what we should want first above everything else? The kingdom of God. If the church, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, independents, whoever you are, libertarians, it doesn't matter. If we're believers in Jesus Christ, the first thing we should do is seek the kingdom of God. That's the first thing. We should not be complaining about our government. We should be seeking first the kingdom of God. Let me ask you this. Has any of your complaining benefited anything? Will seeking first the kingdom of God benefit anything? Yes. When you get to heaven... God's not going to ask you what political party you were affiliated with. He's not going to ask you who you voted for. He doesn't care. What he cares about is the body of Christ to take on the assignment that God has given us to seek first the kingdom of God. 
the church has gotten so, we've lost our vision of the purpose of the scripture that we get caught up in everything going around us. We get caught up in the anger, the frustration. If Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Whatever it is you need. Whatever you need. He knows that you need houses. He knows that you need food. He knows you need protection. He knows you need shelter. He knows that your family needs to be loved. If we will seek first the kingdom of God and learn to bless each other, God will begin to change the outcome of our nation. It is in the hands of the church for this nation to change. Whether you think it's doing great or whether you think it's doing bad, the only way this nation is going to change is for the church to become the church and seek first the kingdom of God. That means that we, got, that, that means we have to stop getting irritated and frustrated with each other over things that don't matter. It doesn't matter. If somebody irritates you, how do you respond to them? What'd you say? What's the scripture say? If they persecute you, if they despitefully use you, what are you supposed to do? Bless them. Bless them. What does that mean? Bless them. How do you bless them? What did you do when you sneeze? Why do we do that? When people sneeze and we say, God bless you, are we serious about that or is it just a cliche that we use? Don't bless somebody. Don't say, God bless you, unless you're serious about it. I want to step out here and probably get myself in trouble with this, but it's okay. I've been in trouble before. Um, using that phrase, God bless you, and you're, not seriousing, and you're not serious about it, could borderline on taking the name of the Lord God in vain. Never thought of it that way, did you? Bless, but be serious about it. Be serious about it. Two weeks ago, I had you stand up and I said, if you have a struggle with President Trump, I want you to stand up and say, Lord, thank you for our president and I bless him in Jesus' name. I had others who said that they had a hard time when Obama was president. I had you to stand up and say, Lord, thank you for President Obama and I bless him in Jesus' name. And guess what? It did not hurt us to do it, did it? And what it did, this is what it did. It caused us to think differently. Because we have Republican Christians, we have Democrat Christians, we have Libertarian Christians, we have Independent Christians, and we all want one thing, Jesus. So why do we allow the political arena of this world to divide us? That is a scheme of the enemy. And we should never allow that to divide us. Yesterday I sat in a restaurant and everyone sitting in this restaurant had their eyes glued to a TV at about 7.15 in the evening. And I was watching the faces of people as the excitement over this thing they call a ball. It's not even a ball. Balls are round. It's not even a ball. And people are going crazy over this weird shaped ball. And we can't get the church to get excited about Jesus in the same way. 
Because in reality, who cares if OU wins or OSU wins? Oh, I know you care. (laughs) (laughs) But in reality, how does it affect your life? It doesn't. But the kingdom of God will. And how we function as a church is going to affect our sphere of influence. And I'm calling this house, this body of believers, to become serious about seeking the kingdom of God. And to become serious about blessing each other and blessing our country and blessing God. I'm calling this body of believers to stop speaking negative against our government. Period. No matter who's in office. I put a post out the other day. Everyone should be happy because everyone has a piece of the government now. Democrats have their place. Republicans have their place. Everybody's in charge. So everyone should be happy, right? You would think, and not. We're still fighting. Can I ask this house, what's the name of this house? Abundant Life. Comes out of John 10, 10 that says this. The thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that what? More abundantly. More abundantly. How many of you want an abundant life? Bless the Lord. And bless the people around you. And bless your government. I want this house to become known as a house of blessing. A house of blessing. Can we do that? How many of you will do that with me? Good, stand up. Stand up. We're almost done. Okay, so I took 20 minutes, or 16 minutes. Now, we're going to eat spaghetti, so dinner's already ready, so you don't have to run beat the Baptist to the buffet. They're already there, so it doesn't matter. So we're going to eat right here. So... I want you to find somebody that you normally don't hang with and I want you to bless them. Cannot be a family member. Has to be someone else. Go. Find someone. Cannot be family. Somebody you don't know. Go to them. Don't walk out of the room because you don't want to do it. Stay in here. Find somebody and bless them. Love on them. Bless them. I don't care about the weather. I don't care about the weather. Bless you. (laughs) Bless you. So, so what's that mean? Wait, the heart or the stomach? All right, so, so I gave you a great testimony this morning about Thomas. Let me give you another great testimony. Carol has been having stomach issues now for about six months. We have been praying for her. She went to the doctor this week, and everything is clear, and she's been discharged, and she's doing wonderful. Amen. Listen, God heals. God sets free. Amen. Now, I think they're almost ready in the back or in the, over in the hospitality room. So if you want to begin to head that way, you can head that way. And Teresa will give you instructions back there. And then after we eat spaghetti, we're going to have a cakewalk in the overflow room. If you don't have money with you today, Don't run away. Go through that door. Teresa wants you going out that door. Are you all ready, Teresa? 
Okay, go out that door. If you don't have money with you today, eat with us anyway. And then tell Teresa what's going on and we'll work it all out. Go out that door into the hospitality room. Bless you. Thank you for joining us online.